Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning, each one, some in particular, because some have had a scary week, and we're so glad to see them and, and the way the Lord has blessed people with health and ability to be here. Uh, we praise Him. So there was in Sunday school one day a class learning about how God cares for us in times of trouble. And the teacher asked the class to draw pictures that pictures of things that made them afraid. And um, after they had finished drawing, each child was to explain to the others what he or she had drawn. Well, there was a little five-year-old named Scott who had created in vivid crayon uh, a looming funnel cloud and a car and a man in his drawing. And he described how the man couldn't get his car started and, and the tornado was bearing down on him and so forth. The teacher asked, that man really, really needs to pray, doesn't he? And Scott surprisingly and sharply said, no, he needs to run. <laughs> so there is a time for prayer and there's a time for action. And we see this, I think, in the letter of Jude. Uh, this brief little letter was no doubt a call to action to those who originally read it and heard it read. Jude warns them about some things. He, he warns them about some troublesome people in the church. He exhorts them to be willing to contend for the faith. So he calls them to action. But here at the end, he also directs them in prayer. And what a wonderful prayer it is that closes this letter. And I'd just like us to look at it together this morning and meditate on it a bit. So it's the last two verses of the book of Jude, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. I've always been amazed as I have studied Scripture through the years how much richness there is in it and and how much there is to learn from it in literally every nook and cranny of this book. You know, sections like this that we come to today, right at the end of a book, uh, we tend to skim over, I think, and perhaps miss the great blessing that is there for us. Um, you know, oftentimes we don't spend much thought on the opening or the closing of a book or a letter uh, like this, but we really ought to. We miss out on a lot when we fail to pay attention to verses like this. So Jude finishes his letter with this great prayer. It's often called a doxology. You've probably heard that term before. What does that word mean? A doxology literally is a word of glory. And the glorious word here is, of course, about God. God is the glorious one. Jude has all along been directing us toward God. God is the goal of all of this. So the goal was not ultimately to uh, slam false teachers or to call troublemakers names and, and show how tough Jude was. The goal was not to build a following or to create other little Judes out there. The goal was to direct people to God. And I want that to be my goal 
as a preacher, as a Christian, as a teacher. And I hope you will think about that as well. So Jude directs his readers to God, and he does so here by directing his words in these closing verses to a special prayer to God, a prayer of glory and praise. Now, I suspect that we don't often pray like this, if we're honest about it. How often do your prayers sound like this? Notice in this prayer there are no requests, there are no complaints, uh, no petitions, no confession. Just praise of the one who we're praying to. I suspect we don't normally have prayers like this. But if you want to enrich your prayer life, if you want to build your prayer life, I would suggest that you add praise to your prayers. And not just in the opening words. So I know we often, when we open a prayer, there are words of praise. Holy God, Almighty God, loving Creator, something like that. And those are wonderful words to, to express in our prayer. But what about the rest of what we say? I would encourage you sometime, just take time and pray praise to God, like Jude does here. I think you will find that a blessing in your prayer life. So we can learn and be reminded of some important things about God in this praise prayer, because again, the focus is on God. And the first thing that Jude says about God in this, in verse 24, is that he is able. Notice that. God is able. Simple statement, but it is very profound. God is able. Do you believe that? God is able. In your life this morning, whatever's going on, do you believe, are you convinced that God is able? If you think about it, that is really the central claim of, of Scripture in many ways, that God is able. He, he has the power to do what he wants to do. He has the will to do it. He is good and he is able. I think we need to be reminded of this simple fact regularly that God is able. So we have an able God. But there's another claim made about him in verse 25. I hope you noticed it as well. There it says that, that God is the only God. It's, of course, an, another one of the great claims of the Bible, that there is only one God. In our Bible study this morning, before, before worship, we were reflecting on this idea that the, early on people struggled um, with many gods, and God patiently worked with people trying to bring them to the truth that there is only one. Well, that truth builds throughout Scripture, and here we have it reflected again God is the only God, and this is one of the great claims of, of all the Bible. All other gods are imposters, you see. Anything be besides God that people worship, that people devote themselves to, is an idol. He is the only true God. Uh, the children of Israel early on, in their history, they asserted this belief. Um, passages like Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4 in the Old Testament. Uh, many people refer to that as the golden text of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And, and, and of course, nothing changed with the New Testament. Jesus himself proclaims this truth. In fact, 
he claimed to be that one true God. He said things like, Before Abraham was, I am. What is the Lord saying? I am God. And the people who heard him say it, that on that occasion, took up stones to kill him because they knew what he was saying. So, God is able, and God is the one and only. And then also, in, in verse 25, there's one more assertion made about God in this prayer of praise, and that is that God is Savior. God is our Savior, and of course, this is closely linked with the Son of God. Uh, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God expresses himself as Savior through Jesus the Son. God's purpose is to be a saving God. Not a punishing God. That's not his purpose. His purpose is to be a saving God. He's a God who wants to rescue people. He doesn't want to condemn people. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so Jude will not let the readers and hearers of this letter forget this truth. Just reflect back on what we've seen in, in these words that Jude wrote. It was sort of a tough letter. You know, he, it's confrontational. Remember, he wanted to write a different kind of letter, but he found it necessary to write this kind of letter. It's confrontational. He has called people out in the course of it. He has condemned false teachers. In fact, frankly, he has called the troublemakers names and, and predicted their eternal demise. It's tough stuff. But he will not let us, in the midst of that, forget the nature of God. What is that? That God loves people. That he wants to save people. And he has made it possible for people to be saved in Jesus Christ. God is able. He is the one and only God. And he is our Savior. And it only gets better from there. Jude says a couple more things. He, he gets more specific. Remember, it's in the form of a prayer here, directed in glorious praise to God, but still designed to teach, you see. And what he says to Christians here ought to be something that will motivate each one of us to praise God and to worship God. Not only in these moments this morning, but for the rest of our lives. He says that God is able to keep you from stumbling. Yes, God is able, and one of the things he's able to do is to keep Christians from stumbling. I hope you appreciate that statement. Now remember all the warnings that have filled this letter. There were real dangers that Jude is writing about. There were real dangers for the church in that day. There were threats that needed to be recognized and needed to be confronted and dealt with. Sometimes that's the case. And even today that can happen, brothers and sisters. Sometimes there are threats, spiritual threats. There are still false teachers. There are still false livers, as we called them a couple of weeks ago. There are rebels against God posing as believers. There are people who would lie and scheme and sneak around and try and pull you down. 
There, were, there are people who would who sing one thing on Sunday and live another way the rest of the week. All those things are threats. Just like in the days of Jude. But Jude reminds us that God is able to keep us from stumbling. God has the power to protect us from all that. We do not have to be spiritual scaredy cats. We don't have to be religious hand ringers who are paralyzed by our fears of the false teachers and the false livers. Some people live scared like that. That is not the intent of Scripture to inspire that kind of living. We are meant to live above that. We have a God who is able to keep us from stumbling. He has the power to protect us from these things. And here is where, I guess you'd say, the rubber meets the road in all this. Do we believe this? Do we believe that God is able? And if so, let's live like it. Because when people see that kind of living, they are drawn to it. And just in case we miss the point that Jude underlines here, he does so just a little bit more. He goes further. And he says that, that God is able to keep us from stumbling and, notice, present us blameless before God. Now that's the miracle of the gospel. And this too ought to inspire your worship of God. See, so one day, Scripture says, we are all going to stand before a holy and righteous God, perfectly sinless. We, we're going to stand before our Creator. We're going to stand before a God who cannot in any way abide in the presence of sin and impurity. He can't be around that. He can't be in the midst of it. And yet we're going to stand there, brothers and sisters. We, who know all too well our own sins and our, our, our weaknesses and our mistakes, we know all too well what we're really like away from this place. And on the inside, don't we? We know our jealousies, we know our bitter thoughts, and our pride, and our lusts, and our dishonesties. Okay? And frankly, all Christians from all times have had all those sins. Even someone like Paul, the great apostle Paul. In his own writings, he said, you know what? I'm the worst sinner that ever lived. He called himself the chief of sinners. How is it possible? How is it possible that sinful people like us can and will stand in the presence of a holy God? Because God through the precious blood of Jesus, will make it happen. He is able. We will be presented before him without blemish. Washed clean. Perfectly acceptable to him. Now I know that it is hard for us living in the flesh right now to imagine that. But that is the promise of scripture. And if that is not true, then Jude is a liar and the entire New Testament is a fraud. You see. But it is true. God is able. He is able to keep you from stumbling and he is able to present you 
one day before himself blameless. Blameless, holy. I don't know where it came from, but I think through the years, some have presented a false view of the final judgment. And the false view is that we will stand before God on that day and our lives will be displayed on a high definition screen for all to see. And, and all our sins will be paraded out there from all our life. And, and we'll be reminded how awful we are. And, and the worst parts of our lives will be dredged up. And, and maybe, you know, if, if there are some good points to us, they'll be put up there too. And maybe if we weren't too bad, maybe, just maybe, God will let us in to heaven. It'll be close by the skin of our teeth. But maybe, hopefully, possibly, he'll let us in. If we have maybe one more good point than bad point. Folks, listen to me, please. If you're really a Christian this morning, that is a lie. That view is a lie. That is not what the scripture says. Scripture says, in comparison to that, that we will be provided an abundant entrance into heaven. Scripture says God is able to present us before himself blameless. You will not sneak in to heaven. You will get in, if you get in, by the blood of Jesus. And if you get in by the blood of Jesus, it will be a no-doubter. Not even close, an abundant entrance if it's by the blood of Jesus. And the citizens of heaven are not going to look on you as if, oh, here's a person that was awfully lucky to make it. Wow, they snuck in. Here's a second class citizen. There are none of those in heaven. There are no second-class citizens. Jude says, in fact, if you notice and you read closely, that your entrance will set off great joy. Heaven will celebrate your entrance because anybody that's there got in the same way by the blood of Jesus. And so if you need a reason to worship today, I don't have a better one to give you. There it is. You know, if, if you've wondered whether it's wor worth worshiping today, remember this prayer. God is able. God is Savior. God will protect us from stumbling, from falling while we're here, and he will welcome us with open arms into his glorious presence when Jesus returns. So to him be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Amen. I hope every person here experiences that. And if you're not confident about it for whatever reason... You're really intended to be confident about it. That's what God wants. He, he sent his son so you could have assurance. And if you're not sure about that, please get with one of us and, and, and seek what could make you sure. Please obey the gospel of Jesus today if you haven't. Meet his blood in the, in the waters of baptism. Please come back to him if you need to. Lord is returning. He's looking for people that look like his son. 
please be one of those. And if we can help you this morning in some way, please let us know while we stand and sing this song.